Oh, hey, I'm Coco, and welcome to our talk show, Single and Too Tired to Mingle. We'll be talking about relationships with ourselves, our exes, our kids, and other important beings. So stay tuned. Justin, welcome to Tuesday Talks. Thank you. <laughs> Great to be here. Thank you. So Justin Rhodes, we'll be talking about crime today. We'll be talking about the legal system and relationships that go wrong for youth and people that turn to crime. You were the federal prosecutor um, in the county of Los Angeles. Tell us a little bit more about that. It's the biggest county in the U.S. In the U.S. The um, way that they do it in the United States is yeah. there's 94 judicial districts. Right. And so California's got four of them. I was in the central district of California, which is 20 million people. So it's seven yeah. counties. It's from the ocean to Arizona, basically. Um, and there's one U.S. attorney in each of those districts who's appointed by the president. And then he or she builds out a team. And so we had about 250 prosecutors. I was one of them in that district. And so it's 250 representing 20 million people. Um, and we're in charge of doing all the federal criminal prosecutions um, in that district. So that's everything from, you know, tax evasion to healthcare fraud, thing, anything related to the borders, immigration, things coming in through the airports and the ports, um, drugs, guns, um, bank robbery, you, you name it. Um, and so it was really a, a grab bag in a district that big. And I was there for about 15 years. Quite exciting, I would imagine. It's a. Everyone says it's the best legal job to have because it's hard to get into court these days, right. especially young lawyers. You know, they watch all the TV shows yeah. and they graduate from law school and want to be in court and they go to work for a law firm. You spend 10 years just reviewing documents. So <laughs> if you want to, you know, sort of be on the cutting edge and then, you know, if you do violent crime like I did, you get to go watch FBI throw flashbang grenades in people's houses at four in the morning. So, you know, there's a little bit of uh, excitement. <laughs> that. Very exciting. OK. Um, yeah, I think I watched um, way too much Suits. So the fact that you went to Harvard Law is very exciting. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just a degree. <laughs> Bit but of <yeah>. a <laughs> Oh, my God. Okay. So relationships are basically everything about yourself, about your family, also about people that you work with. So we're going to be touching a little bit about that as well because um, of the profile that you are at. Um, so let's talk about first, it was quite interesting, I thought, with LAX. Uh, so the airport, you have 1,500 average daily flights. Is the fifth busiest airport, number one origin destination uh, in the world. So, what kind of uh, what kind of things have you found? People try and smuggle in, out. <laughs> well, I mean, you name it. Um, <clears throat> and I think you know, there's all the traditional things you would expect: guns, drugs, uh, a lot of drugs heading out, a lot of drugs heading in. Um, national, you know, secrets. Uh, we do a lot of espionage cases uh, at the airport. Usually, we're catching someone as they're about to catch a flight to a non-friendly nation state. Um, but so then these are people in government or in positions? Uh, or? Oftentimes it's people who are sort of in academia or working for a company that may have defense contractor um, connections. And so they're working for a U.S. defense contractor. They take some plans, they put them onto a hard drive and then go head off to their country of origin where they plan to sell those to the, you know, the country. So, you know, missile parts, things like that. Um, but one of the things that I think I found was fascinating, which I don't think people really think about is that the U.S. has a lot of um, wildlife that's prohibited um, because they're invasive species or because they're protected in certain ways. <clears throat> but they're the types of animals that people in the U.S. want as pets because they're exotic and fancy. Um, and so oftentimes people would smuggle animals from other countries into the U.S., sometimes through the port, but often through the airport because you got to keep them alive. Right. So we had uh, eels, we had sharks. Um, we had one guy who had, I think it was seven baby iguanas in his wooden leg uh, <laughs> that they stopped at the border. Um, and then another guy who had uh, a bunch of songbirds that are illegal in the U.S., I think he was bringing them in from China, um, wrapped in little socks around his leg um, at Unfortunately, not a lot of them made it, um, and I think the ones that did probably had to be euthanized because they weren't allowed. But the the international smuggling of animals and animal parts is um, really fascinating and not something that you kind of think about. How would you smuggle a shark into another country? You put it in a tank, um, and then usually you would ship that one. That's not because right. that the, the X-ray okay. is going to pick that up. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it really people don't care about the welfare of the animals. They're just trying to make a buck, mm -hmm. so they're not. Uh, they're not traveled the way that SeaWorld would travel its orcas, you know, from one park to another. They're really, um, but uh, but it was pretty crazy the things that people would sit on a 16-hour flight attached to their body. I mean, truly snakes on a plane. 
And how do you detect all this stuff? Or, for example, how do you detect that someone's trying to smuggle intelligence out? Well, that is a long-term investigation. Usually, you would, ha- you know, the FBI would be involved. Um, their counterterrorism or counterintelligence right. units, and so they would be doing an investigation. You know, up tapping people's phones, sometimes following them around, doing search warrants on their email to build a case to say, like, we have the evidence on this person. And then, if and when that person went to depart you would stop them because once they're gone, you know, certain countries are not going to extradite someone back. Um, people coming in, I think there's a lot of different ways to catch them. Um, you know, there's patterns. Like if you come from a, a country that produces, you know, opium, you grow a lot of poppies and you're coming to a place in the United States where there's a demand for heroin and you're doing that flight a lot, well, the computer's going to register you eventually and say, let's, let's check that guy's bags. Um, Obviously, there's the x-ray machines and all the drug sniffer dogs. There's just the human element. Um, You know, when you come to any border crossing, usually you're asked, what are you doing here? And sometimes people will ask more questions. Um, And I think there's a lot of folks that get really nervous. um, And those border officers are really well trained to pick up on on kind of the human tells of something is wrong here. Uh, And for instance, they'll notice, they'll ask kids, like, you know, who are you traveling with? You know, is this, this your parent? Is this your, you know, because there is, you know, People do sometimes try to bring children in that they shouldn't. Um, And so I think there's that piece of it. And then obviously there's the the obvious tells the guy with the songbirds. The reason we caught him was because he had bird poop all over his shoes because it had just dripped down over the 16 hour flight. So it's it's kind of this web of of ways to try to figure out, you know, why is it that you're coming to the U.S. and and should you are you bringing something you shouldn't be? Mm, Okay. So, yeah, let's talk about some of your cases. Um. And let's start maybe with the human factor. Are all criminals created equally? No. I mean, there are some that are just, um, I don't want to say dumb because I think that's demeaning, but mm-hmm. they just don't have a, the great faculty to put together the heist that's going to make a movie. Um, okay. You know, I, I had a criminal who snuck back in while he was on pretrial release, snuck back in and tried to rob the place where he was working. And when the alarm went off, the manager called and he picked up the phone <laughs> while he was there in the middle of the night. Right. You know, yeah, there are people that want to get caught. Um so there are, then there's people who are true masterminds. We had a, another group of people, uh, we nicknamed them the rooftop bandits because they would, um, they would find a bank that was sort of in a, you know, strip mall, sort of its own little building um, over a long weekend, break in to the roof, cut a hole in the roof, set off the alarm. Police would show up. There'd be no, nothing wrong. Police would leave, think the alarm was just off. Mm-hmm. And then they would spend the rest of the weekend chiseling into the concrete vault and emptying out all of the the bank's money and also the safety deposit boxes. And they'd get away with, you know, 10 million bucks at a time. So there's a, there's a big delta between smart and not very creative. And then in terms of motivations, if you will, for why you're doing it, I think that is, I don't know if there's people that are truly evil that are just sort of born as criminals. I do think there are people who have, you know, chemical imbalances in their brain Mm -hmm. that make them so sociopathic um, or, you know, willing to do things to other humans that, that you and I and, you know, the rest of society wouldn't do. Yeah. Um, but putting aside that group, which is very hard to solve for, I think there are people who are desperate, you know, people who are drug addicts. And if you can't hold a job, but you have, you know, 100 pounds a week that you need for your drug habit, you're going to find that money some way. You know, you're going to steal copper cables, you're going to rob banks, you're going to do something. Um, so it's sort of one bucket. I think there's another group of people that are looking for belonging. Um, and I think that's really, uh, another hard one to solve for, because if you're a young, you know, 15 year old boy in an underprivileged neighborhood looking upwards and saying like, I don't have a lot of job opportunities. I'm probably not going to make a lot of money. Um, you know, my family may be struggling. Um, and I, where do I belong? Mm -hmm. When you look out across the street, there's a group of your peers who all happen to be in a gang, but are welcoming you providing you protection, providing you, you know, a sense of being, Mm. um, and you join that group. Um, you know, you start off by hanging out and then you start off by doing a little graffiti and then, you know, some people that's, that's the end of it. And then they exit and maybe they go to college and some people, they spend their rest of their life sort of on that path and it, you know, the crimes get bigger. Um, and then you go into prison, especially in California, the state prisons are really a, a breeding ground for the gangs. And so you show up in prison and guess what? There's your your gang is there as well. Do you learn more when you're, you're in prison? You <laughs> absolutely learn more. Um, you get more tattoos, and then you, you know, when you come out, not only do you have a felony conviction, so it's harder to get a job, but you've sort of, you know, earned your rep as someone who's willing to, you know, take one for the team. Mm. And and that sort of that that belonging cycle is really hard to break. Oh, um, 
So what's the what's the path, for example? I create a crime, mm-hmm. I get caught. Yep. So what happens? Does it depend on the crime or is there like a linear trajectory? Kind of I, everyone goes through the same thing. It, I mean, it, it does depend. I will say I'm speaking only for US and you know, UK, obviously, yeah. it's a very different model. But you know, if you get caught for a what we'll call a reactive crime where, you know, you're robbing a bank or you're caught with a gun in your car that you're not supposed to have. You get arrested. Mm-hmm. If you get arrested in the morning, you might go to court that afternoon. You get arrested in the afternoon, you're probably spending the night in jail. Right. You get your phone call. That is one of the few things where the stories get it right. The, the okay. shows get it right. <laughs> the shows get it right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you'll show up in court the next day and you'll have a lawyer. Who should you call? Your lawyer? Or your I, mother? <laughs> well, I mean, not a lot of people have a lawyer sort of on retainer. Like if, you, if you already have a lawyer <laughs> yeah, right. in speed dial, you've done this before. I'm not going to advise you. Uh, but yeah, you call your family and they'll get you a lawyer. Right, okay. um, and if you can't afford one, just like they say in the movies, okay. um, you, you do get one appointed to you. Okay. And you'll show up in court and your lawyer will tell you, we're going to plead not guilty. Um, and then usually there's kind of a, a discussion with the prosecution and the judge about whether or not you should stay in jail. Because if you're, if if we caught you as you were heading to the airport to fly to a non-extradition okay. country, well, I'm not going to let you out on bond yeah. because you're going to split out of here. But if you said, you know, let's say you were just stealing mail, you know, which is a federal offense, but not a, one of the bigger ones. Mm-hmm. And you have a stable family here. So we think you're going to stay here. You know, you'll be out uh, on release until your trial. Okay. And then, and then what I think is one of the things that I like most about the, our judicial system is the next process is that the government turns over all the evidence it has against you all the stuff that says that you're guilty, but all the stuff that says you're maybe not guilty. Right. And you and your lawyer get to sort of pour over that and decide, you know, do we want to take a swing at trial or are we going to plead guilty? Um, and the truth is about 95% of cases um, do not go to trial, which means that people will will take a plea agreement of some sort or another. Mm, for it slightly- doesn't seem like that when you watch kind of all these series, which there are a lot of, it doesn't seem like people don't go to trial. Plea agreements are far less sexy than trial. I'll that is true. That. <laughs> um, but no, so 95% of cases, give or take, right. will plead guilty. And then if you feel that you truly are innocent um, or you just can't stomach the idea of going to jail and you're willing to swing for the fences, you'll go to trial. And that in the federal system could be a year away. Uh, oh, wow. And so you work with your lawyer. So what do you do for a year then? Well, if you're in custody, you're in jail. Right. Um, if you're out and about, you're trying to work, you're trying to abide by conditions. Maybe you've got an ankle monitor on to make sure you don't run. I've actually seen that. It was yeah. quite bizarre. Someone came into a spa and I'm like, you literally have an ankle bracelet. Like what? It's You You, you start to notice them in my job. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, so, so you're, you know, you're kind of trying to live your life during that period of time. Mm. And then you go to trial. Um, I don't know what the number is, but I'd say 75 to 80% of cases, you know, that go to trial, person gets convicted. Right. Um, and then you'll get sentenced and the judge, you know, depending on how bad of a person you have been from a standpoint of how many crimes you've committed in the past right. and then how bad the crime is that creates this kind of chart. And then there's a recommended sentence and the judge can use that one, go above or below and, and sentence you. And then if you're sentenced to prison, you know, a couple of weeks later, uh, you head off to one of the Bureau of Prisons federal facilities scattered throughout the United States. And what you were saying before that you know, you learn more in prison or you find your gang friends in there. Do you tend to split them up in gangs or do they end up in the same prison? Let's say if, if they're all caught in LA, do they all go to the same prison there or do you scatter them around? Well, that's bit? actually a, something that we um, we tried hard to do, or not tried hard, but is part of our, our federal system of gang prosecutions is if you're convicted in California, um, and this is one of the differences from the UK, right. you know, there's California law and there's federal law. Right. So if you're convicted of a California violation, you can only go to a California prison and there's only so many of them. So the odds that you're going to find your, your buddies there, your buddies there <laughs> yeah. is pretty high. Right. If you're convicted of a federal violation, there are a couple federal prisons in California, but there are also federal prisons throughout the United States. And so oftentimes the Bureau of Prisons will try to separate you. And so you're from a gang in Los Angeles. Guess what? You end up in Oklahoma or Florida or New York. um, And your your ties to that gang are start to fray. And your odds, frankly, of coming back out of there with a job, opportunities to, you know, do something new um, are better. And so it was one of the things that we, why we liked to do federal prosecutions, because it didn't just you know, um, fuel the revolving door um, mm. that, that we felt we were dealing with on the state level. Are there any red flags that can predict the outcome that someone's going to turn into a criminal? Let's say. I wish. Because that... we have affluent families turning to crime and we have, you know, lower socioeconomic people turning to crime. Yeah, I don't. 
I mean, I, or is I, it just different crime. I, it, it's different, but I don't believe there's no there's no genetic thing. There's no um, you know I don't I don't think anyone could come forward and say you are more likely to. Mm. However, if you you know from a less affluent family, if you don't have opportunities and you are around people who are also committing crime, I think yes, you are more likely to be someone who commits crime. If you have a lot of money, what's going to make you turn? Like, are you going to be one of those billionaire Wall Street traders who yeah. decides I want to do some inside trading? because I want to be a two billionaire rather than a one billionaire. You know, there's just some greed aspects to that, but I think those are hard to find. I think you you look at, you know, where they are and what they need. Um, and, uh, but, you know, there is no, that, that, that Tom Cruise movie, right. pre-crime, there's no pre-crime that we can do. <laughs> it's uh, <the> blueprint. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no blueprint to it. Um, and, you know, and I think that's also part of the, the beauty of the system is that everyone comes in treated as a, you know, a person with a clean slate, you know, and we're looking at what crime you committed now. Like, well, you know, why are you here now? What have you done? Not what was your family? You know, it, right. when it comes to sentencing, there's a lot of fluffy papers that get written about how, oh, he's on the board of his church. He's a great golfer. You know, let's be nice to this guy. Um, but the truth of the matter is you walk in the door as just a person who is accused of a crime and, mm -hmm. and we're going to kind of disassemble the evidence and see whether, you know, a jury of your peers thinks you committed it or not. So is it innocent until proven guilty or is it guilty until proven innocent? I think it is innocent until proven guilty. I mean, I know that um, there's a lot of people who have, you know, problems with the way the legal system in this country and in the States works. Um, and I think there's, you know, it has gotten a bad rap um, for some notable cases. But I do think that the people that I worked with and especially a lot of the, the really hardworking police detectives and FBI agents, you know, they come in with the view of like, let's just find what the evidence is and let's find the right guy. Um, but there are people who, you know, and I'm not going to lie, especially places in the, in the States where, you know, the color of your skin and the jury you pick is going to make a big difference in, you know, what that group might think about you. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Um, but I think we do our best to try to, you know, uphold people's in our country constitutional rights um, throughout the process. And and that's one of the, the beauties of my job was that it, because there's so many people and so many crimes, you know, we had the opportunity to pick the ones where we thought that there was an impact to be made and we had the evidence. Right. Whereas, you know, in the district attorney's office, you're a district attorney, you walk in that day, you get handed five files and say, you're going to trial tomorrow. And so you don't, you know, you're just, you're, you're, you're forced to process a lot more and there isn't as much thinking time. Uh, and that's not a critique of the DAs that I, we worked with, just of the volume of cases that they had to deal with. And so there, you know, I never felt like I was going after someone who was innocent. I never had that nagging feeling of like, am I doing this person wrong? Obviously there is that feeling that you get as a prosecutor of, man, this guy had no chances. Um, he did the thing that we say he did and he's going to have to do time for it. But he had just was dealt the crappiest oh. hand. Um, and so that, you know, that is a challenge to the job. Can you feel if someone's innocent or guilty? Can't like, feel it. Um, after a certain amount of years and experience? No, I mean, there are, we get to work with amazing um, agents. The The FBI has a behavioral analysis unit. Right. Um, who not just doing poly, you know, lie detectors, but will sit there and like watch someone's interview and they can read minds in really creepy ways um, and predict behaviors and say, here's the evidence. What kind of a person would create, you know, commit this crime? Well, statistically speaking, it's probably a, a white male of this age, you know, employed without a family, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot that, that can be done to, draw the net of suspects. Right. Um, but I can't sit across from someone and say you're guilty or not. You talked about the rooftop bandits. Uh, so did you give a lot of your kind of case <coughs> names or perpetrators names? And what were you some of your like highest profile cases that you well, handled? The, the naming happens um, kind of in, in two ways. Usually if it's a big law enforcement operation where we're going to go out and sweep up 50 gang members, um, that's going to be a two-year investigation. And so it's going to be, you know, operation, you know, gunpowder or something like that. Right. Uh, and who comes up with these names? Usually the agents do. They come up with the name before they run it by us. And sometimes it's like there was one, it was Operation Skull Crusher, I think. And I was like, that <laughs> doesn't sound right because we're yeah. the police and we should not be crushing skulls. Um, but so that, that's, there's those naming conventions. The other one that I got to be a part of was if you, you know, Coco, if you walk into a bank and, you know, pretend to have a gun and say, yeah. give me your money, they're going to give you some money and you're going to walk out. Uh, you'll be investigated, but that's sort of, you know, 
you'll just be that one of a many cases in their file. You do it again, mm-hmm. you start to get interested. Third or fourth time, and then you're going to become a bandit because right. you're going to become a recurrent problem that we feel someday you're actually going to pull out that gun that might be real and cause some real trouble. So if you, what what we're going to do is give you a name so that we can then push it out on the FBI bulletin boards to the public. And so you want a name that people sort of catch on to here. You know, if you walked in wearing, um, you know, a, a Erling Holland jersey, you'd be the Man City Bandit, right? Or something like that. Um, uh, you've had some funny sunglasses, you'd be the Tom Cruise Bandit or whatever it was. And so that name then sticks with you until you get caught because we want people to be aware of it. Um, the other nicknames though, come from the criminals themselves. Like every, if you're in a gang, if you, if you go by Justin Rhodes, you're not cool. Like you need to be like, you know, skinny or like criminal or like something like that. So those names you then get, you probably get tattooed on you. Right. Um, and so, you know, criminals name themselves and we name criminals. Um, but obviously in court, you are defendant Rhodes. You're not, uh, okay. we don't call you by your nicknames. <laughs> um, you were asking about big yeah, cases? Your high, yeah, what, what are some of your high profile cases that you've been involved in? We had one where uh, an American TV producer went with his wife and two kids down to Mexico for a vacation. And while he was down there, he killed her um, pretty brutally. Um, and then while the Mexican police were investigating, he snuck back up to the U.S. because right. that border crossing is relatively easy to do. Um, we didn't have evidence or charges against him, but the Mexican authorities did. And so what we had to do was go through the process of extraditing him. And so we basically had to do a mini trial here in this, back there in the States to prove that what Mexico had was sufficient. Um, and then we were successful. And then they, we were able to transfer him down to Mexico. Um, and he was tried down there and convicted and served time in a Mexican prison. So that, that made some headlines because, you know, you have a, um, you know, a U.S. TV producer, sort of a well-known individual. So we did that. The Rooftop Bandits was another one that um, I was one of my favorites. Um, I was the bank robbery coordinator for a number of years. So a lot of the bank robberies in Southern California, which was, we've, we've since lost it, was the bank robbery capital of the world for a while. Okay. I think uh, Detroit took took over after we did. Um, we had one called the Million Dollar Burrito, which is the name we gave it, which was two guys were driving, driving for an armored truck company right. and stopped for lunch at a Mexican restaurant, tossed about a million bucks out the back door into a trash can where one of their wives picked it up. Um, and we found part of it, but the rest sort of disappeared until we got some whispers that maybe it was in the landscaping of one guy's house. So we got a search warrant, not for the house, but for the backyard. And so <laughs> I was there as the FBI walked around with a big stake, punching it into the lawn and finally hit something hard and dug up the lawn and found $600,000 in a okay. in a Tupperware container. So, <laughs> you know, you have fun ones like that. And then you have um, big cases where, you know, we would spend two years doing wiretaps and um, controlled drug deliveries and set up, you know, cameras and have informants go into meetings and then, you know, take down pretty much an entire gang. Um, and so that, that was satisfying because you would, you try to give the neighborhood a chance to breathe. Right. Because, you know, if you take out one gang member, another one repl- yeah. replaces it. And I don't, I don't profess to say that we ever solved crime in those neighborhoods, but it does give a moment of peace that maybe, you know, the neighborhood can kind of come together and, and when those guys start getting out, there'll be enough structure there that they won't come back to where they were before. Okay. So it's not like you're doing something perpetually does actually make a difference to, to a community at some point. Yeah. I, I don't know what they call it here, but there's a carnival game called Whack-A-Mole where you just yeah, yeah, hit yeah, the thing. Is, yeah. but there's, you know, law enforcement is some of that. Like mm. there, if crime pays, there is always someone who's willing to, you know, to do the crime. And so there is a very much, you have to steal yourself for the prospect that every day you're going to walk in and someone's going to be doing something stupid again. And the fact that you put out a press release last week of don't do the stupid thing because this guy's going to get 10 years in prison didn't convince guy number two not to do it. Um, you have to sort of come to terms with that and just still put your suit on and show up. <laughs> oh, my God. So does crime pay? It really depends. Um, low level crime. You know, you watch The Wire, mm. right? And all these guys are selling crack cocaine at the bottom. Like it does not pay. Right. And your risk to reward ratio is all off. As I was saying about bank robberies, mm. you walk in the door, you get a couple thousand dollars easily without even a, you know, a weapon, but you're going to get caught. Mm. So I think, you know, the, the places where it paid were the places where it was more complex, like fraud, you know, right. a lot of white collar crimes where people, 
would spend their you know educational know-how and also their time to embezzle millions of dollars from their company and when they were caught could hire the best lawyers mm. in the state who could then tie up the process and slow it down not to say that a good defense lawyer defeats us mm. but it does makes it harder um, and maybe you get a better plea deal because you've dragged it out for three years and finally we're just like all right take your six month suspended sentence pay back all the money you you've taken but you don't go to prison so uh, yeah the crime can pay um and i think in the in the days of the internet um it's rampant you know by the way there no one is offering to uh have you store money for their prince friend from an african nation <laughs> don't do that <laughs> There's no, there's no African prince. There's no, there's no African prince who needs you to hold his money. So don't wire him your bank details. Um, that's going to be one of our other podcasts, actually. Uh, online fraud. So online fraud. Oh, please, so, please do yeah, that. Because the have, romance scams. That's um, it. Exactly. We'll be talking exactly about that. Yeah. So I mean, we started so to see that. And really, the, uh, the heartbreaking one was a lot of elderly fraud. Yeah. We actually had our own task force just mm, de yeah. devoted to teaching our elderly community what not to respond to because they're not as savvy with yeah. technical stuff. And um, banks how, now have a special division for romance fraud. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we'll be talking about that yeah. as well. And then people are always doing these quizzes online. Like, what's your pet's name? Yeah. Where did you get married? Yeah. You know, what's your mother's maiden name? Like, you've actually given them all the security questions that you're going to need when you log into your bank. So, I, you know, I just... So don't do that? Don't do that. Don't, do that. <laughs> don't trust people on the internet. How successful is criminal rehab rehabilitation? I think it really depends on how the person comes in. I mean, if you are a 20 year drug addict, it is going to be really hard to rid you of that. If that's one of the drivers right. of what's causing you to turn to criminality, you know, I, there are pretty good drug rehab programs in prison, yeah. but there's pretty good re drug re rehab programs everywhere. And if you can shake it, then I think you're going to come out well. Um, if you don't have a job and you're committing crime and you can go in and give yourself some skills so that when you come out you're you're marketable mm -hmm. then i think it works but I, you have to buy in and say i want to do this um some people i mean some people frankly enjoy being in prison because it's you know three hots in a cot as they say and they have their buddies there i'm not sure i'm sure they'd rather be on the street mm -hmm. but it doesn't it's not a massive deterrent to them and so while they're in prison they're not going to really mm -hmm. figure out how to to live better but we, we i've seen a lot of great success stories okay um and a lot of people who I saw, you know, robbing their third bank um, after their third conviction for bank robbery. And I kept saying, like, you get, we, you, we got to stop meeting this way. Um, <laughs> uh, given that you've been part of high profile cases and in the media, how does it affect you personally? Because these criminals must know you. They eventually come out. Do you ever worry about that? Or? Yeah, it's funny because... Um, uh, that's the, the the Thanksgiving question that you have. Like every aunt, when you first start this job, is like, aren't you worried that you're going to get stabbed? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think we all in the office did our part to make our service harder, harder to find, you know, by using mailboxes. You know, you can pay services to take your names and stuff off the internet. Mm -hmm. I'm like the only person of my age group who never had a Facebook account. Um, you know, maybe that's cool now, but it wasn't for <laughs> yeah. a period of time. Uh, so I think there's a way to be a little bit more anonymous. What I found was that for the hardened gang criminal, you know, those guys, I wouldn't want to meet them on a dark alley. But at the same time, they have been through the process so many times and met so many prosecutors and so many cops and so many judges that I'm just another person in the system. If I send them away for 20 years, maybe I stand out. But in general, they have they have run into the system so much that mm. I, I didn't feel like I was the, the nail that was sticking up that they wanted to hammer down. On the other hand, there were some fraudsters who had never been convicted, who thought they were smarter than everybody else. And they worried me because they're the type of person who's not going to get a long sentence. They're going to get out and have a vendetta mm. against someone because, you know, they thought they were smarter than everyone. And now they've been taken down a peg. They have a conviction that keeps them from getting loans and getting jobs. But they're also, they're smart enough that they're the kind of person who can wipe out your bank account or, you know, open up a mortgage in your name or something like that. So th those were a little scary. Um, there were, there were never times that I felt like I was going to be, you know, physically assaulted. But nonetheless, you were standing in court on the first day that someone gets, you know, brought in. Mm. And if they're, you know, they're in shackles and they're standing, you know, six feet away from you. 
um, and you're saying to the judge, this is what this person did, and this is why this person should stay in jail until trial. And that doesn't make them very happy, and it certainly doesn't make their family happy who's sitting in the rows behind you. Um, that was that was a hard one, was coming out of sentencing, where the judge had proclaimed a sentence, the defendant was taken away, and you'd walk out into the hallway of the courthouse, and there was, you know, his uncle, his aunt, his grandmother, just giving you the eye, like... You know, I can't believe you have done this to our baby. Um, <laughs> and, you know, everyone sees their children uh, so, yeah. as, as perfect angels. Um, but those that was probably the um, the most unsettling because, you know, not that grandma's going to hit you with her cane. But there's still, you know, <laughs> did I expect that my car would be, uh, you know, tires punctured sometimes? Yeah. <laughs> Were they? No. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> so... You're obviously working in LA where you have high profile media cases as well. So we had a recent one with Johnny Depp and his Amber Heard and also OJ Simpson. So I think these were kind of like maybe the biggest ones. How much does media interfere with cases that you guys do? It's, I mean, after the OJ Bronco chase, yeah. right? It's sort of baked in now that if you, you know, arrest someone high profile, it's going to be, it's going to be a big lift just to get through all of that noise. You know, our office, we didn't do the OJ case. That was the district attorney's office. But we prosecuted some um, some city council members, um, some U.S. congressmen, um, a couple, you know, uh, uh, one guy who was running for president at one point. So you have to know that when you're going to, if they're going to go to trial, like leading up to trial, it's the judge. And the, the judge is, you know, a, a federally appointed or a presidentially appointed judge with life tenure. They don't need to run for office. They don't need to press anyone. So I never felt that that was going to sway them. It's the jury, though, because when they want to go to trial, you have to pick a jury of the defendant's peers. And your goal is to find people who are non-biased, who can understand what's going on, make good decisions. Um, but you have to recognize that the odds that they haven't heard of this person are probably zero. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, there was just a case uh, back in the States uh, against um, former President Trump. No one is going to expect a jury doesn't know who he is. Yeah. But you do have to spend some time trying to figure out, like, what what news outlets are you reading? Yeah. And, you know, how much are you going to be influenced by what you're hearing? The, the ultimate step you can take is that during the trial, you can sequester a jury, which is right. what they did with the OJ jury, which is where you pick them all up. And you put them in a hotel for the duration of the trial. That doesn't happen very often. Um, but you do worry that they're going to go home at night when you say, oh, this person was killed by, you know, a gunshot wound to the thorax or something. They're going to look it up like, oh, can you really die by a gunshot wound to the thorax? You know? uh, and so people start doing their own research. Or they go visit the scene of the crime. Oh, do that. Oh, yeah. Wow. So um, there is a concern. Um, but again, it's it's so part of our world now You that news travels so fast and that yeah. people consume news from so many different places that I think you just have to, instead of assuming that they're coming in with a, a clean slate, you just have to understand what's on their slate right. like, and what's feeding that. Um, and hopefully pick people that are, you know, not wearing tinfoil hats. Uh, <laughs> to court. <laughs> to court yeah. um, what about, so for example, when you, um, you're dealing with a case that's last, you know, it's lasting for a long time, or you perhaps, what's the word, like snitches, which then work for you. Yeah. Um, do you ever form bonds with them or how do those relationships take place? Like just in the workplace? Yeah. I mean, it, so you you charge five people with a crime, you know, pick a drug distribution, bank robbery, whatever. And it's, they want to go to trial. So it's going to be a period of time. Well, the likelihood that one of them says, you know what, I'm looking at 20 years if I go to trial, but the government has offered me five or 10 years if I work with them, well, people flip. Like it's it's only in the movies, you know, La Cosa Nostra, where the you know Omerta or whatever it is, the the, the code of silence is strong yeah. enough that people don't flip anymore. Even now, the Italian mafia is kind of full of holes. But someone will flip, and then you start working with them, and they come in and they sit down with you. And again, they're in their orange jumpsuit with their lawyer, and you're there with an armed federal agent, and you're talking, you know, mm. and you're just taking notes, and you're just learning who they are, where they came from, and then all the details of the crime. Hopefully they have a good memory and you can kind of piece together the evidence. But in those meetings, and you're waiting for the U.S. Marshals to come pick them up and they're eating a bagged sandwich and you're kind of just chatting, 
they turn out to be fascinating people sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and they start asking about your life and you ask about their life. And so it, in that moment, it is friendly, but you have to remind yourselves that you are not their friend mm-hmm. and that given any opportunity, they would turn on you to get their sentence cut in half mm-hmm. again. Um, and so you have to be very careful about what you say to them, not just from a self-preservation standpoint. You can't promise anything you can't deliver yeah. because then they're just going to say, oh, Justin said, you know, if I say this, this is what's going to happen. And so it's a really strange dance where you want them to be the best witnesses they can be. And you want them to be honest um, and fulsome with their answers. Uh, but you also don't want to share more than you need to share. Um, and then some of them go into you know witness protection. That's also another thing that actually does exist. Yeah. And I, I don't anymore. But when I was, um, I would still hear from people who I'd put in witness protection, you know, five years before, just checking in. Um, <laughs> what did they say to you then? Yeah, sometimes it was, you know, hey, I'm still in prison. Can you help me? But do it? they have your email? <laughs> no, they, they go through. There's a, an oh, office in right, the Department of Justice. Email you personally. Don't need to email me personally. <laughs> Um, but then every once in a while, you know, I would reach out to the office and say, Hey, you know, this, you know, John Smith, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't know where he is because witness protection, his name has been changed. You know, is he doing all right? And they can check in, Mm -hmm. um, us marshals will check in and say, yeah, you know, working, um, successful, all of that. And those are the stories where someone, you feel good. Someone has made an active decision to leave the lifestyle because if, you know, they'll be killed if they try to go back into it. And they've, you know, moved across the country, changed their whole being, right? They're not allowed to contact any of their old friends. Mm. They become a new person. Um, And it takes a lot of fortitude to stay on that path. But there are success stories where they just, you know, they swear off the the old uh, life and create new bonds in a new community and with a new name. So you can actually meet someone and have no idea this person is actually in a witness protection program. And they're supposed to never tell them. Wow. Yeah. That is it's pretty Creepy. wild. Yeah. So as you go into the dating world, you know, make make sure you I think, ask that question. I think I'm done. Are, are, are you in the witness protection program? Could you tell me if you were? Just wink once with yeah. yes, twice for no. Can I see? Are you wearing an ankle monitor? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to the spa for a day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's just too weird to even think about. What about the relationship between a prosecutor and a defense attorney? You guys must see each other all the time. We do. Um, and it's funny because half the time you are in the situation I was just talking about where you're trying to get that defense attorney to have their client come in and work with you. And the other half the time you're in court just bashing each other's heads in with books um, <laughs> over you know what the evidence is. Mm. Uh, and so you have to you have to use the professional courtesy, um, you know, the joke is why don't sharks bite other sharks, right? You know, it's a professional courtesy. Yeah. Um, but right. um, the uh, the dance is strange because you learned there's people you can trust and people that have burned you. And right. once someone has burned you, you know, you're supposed to, you you have to treat their client with the same way you would treat any other client. So you can't punish the client because they've chosen an, an a-hole of a lawyer. Um, but at the same time, Am I going to extend the same level of openness um, and dialogue? Probably not, because I don't think that person is going to do with it something that's appropriate. Um, and so that that was always a challenge. You know, the judges sit up on the bench. You never really get to talk to them. And, you know, they're sort of in their own play, in their own world. But the defense lawyers is a is a continuing cycle um, and you're all swimming in the same pool. And so you have to be kind. Do you miss your job? I miss the the teamwork. Um, you know, we were all there. We all took a massive pay cut when we left private practice, which most of us did to go into government. Um, but you you sort of put on a you know you a jacket that's like a mission, mm. you know, and you're working with really dedicated law enforcement agents, and your goal is to serve justice. You know, the Department of Justice. And so I took that seriously, and it it you know. On a Monday morning when you don't want to go to work, you just have to remind yourself, what am I going to do today? I'm going to go in and I'm going to try to make our community safer. I'm going to try to catch the bad guys. And and that's as silly as that sounds, is a pretty motivating factor. Um, and then when you all get together and you solve the crime, you know, yeah. we all like watching murder mysteries. Like when you mm. when you actually get that piece of evidence that that opens up the door, it's it's fascinating. Mm. And you get to go to trial. I love going to trial. So I miss I miss pieces of that. Um, but I, you know, I did 15 years there. I ended up managing the office uh, in part for a while. 
so I, I sort of had I had the run. So I don't I don't think I'm going to go back to it. But I really respect all the people who are there and, and what they're doing. So what would you do now in an ideal world? I don't know. Um, while I'm here in London, I can't practice law because of mm. the because uh, I don't look good in a wig, frankly. Um, <laughs> that's the only reason. <laughs> yeah, that's really the only reason. I don't know. I think um, I do think there's other problems that are more in need of solving than crime. Okay. Um, and so maybe I can take this skill set that I have and some of, you know, some of my experience and aim it towards that. You know, climate change is one that I think is kind of universal that we can't we can't divide it up and be like, oh, this is the central district of California's problem. Yeah. Like this is all of our problems. So, you know, if I can find a way to to sort of take some take some burden off of others and and help with that, maybe. But you know, right now it's fun to tell war stories and uh and <laughs> look back on some of the crazy capers that we had. Yeah, I'm sure it's fascinating. Um would there be like a positive takeaway message for our viewers and listeners? who perhaps uh, are thinking about going and turning into crime. No, just in general. Well, that, I mean, that was always a problem. As the, the bank robbery coordinator, people would say, what's the best way to commit a yeah. bank robbery? And I'd say, I'm not going to tell you. Would you, you be know? good at that? <laughs> like, <laughs> if we wanted to rob a bank together. I have thought about um, taking some of my stories and, you know, selling them to Hollywood. But no, I think the takeaway is that um, that for as much... Um, grief as the police and and law enforcement and judges and, and the system can get. Um, at the end of the day, there are people who have made great sacrifice mm. and continue to make great sacrifices. I mean, police officers put on a badge and a, frankly a bulletproof vest every day and walk out the door, not quite knowing what that day will yeah. be. Um, and that the system isn't perfect, but there's a lot of people every day trying to make it the best it can be. Um, and I think it's one of the best in the world. And so I just, you know, I'm very positive about law enforcement and I think there's a lot of structural changes we can make around the edges, but I think the sort of the beating heart of it are the people. Um, and I just, you know, you know, I'm not saying go out and hug a cop, but I'm saying that I think, you know, whenever you get down on something, I think you need to step back and be like, what, what are my problems with it? Um, and I think, you know, I ne have never had a problem with the people that were committed to the mission of making the place safer. And so I just, I, I think about them a lot and um, and what they do and really respect that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Justin. That was fascinating. Thank you. <laughs>